And now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Gianna Engler. Uh, Professor Engler uh, received her PhD at Georgetown University in 2016, and afterwards spent some time at the Center for Political Theory as a postdoc at Brown University. Since 2018, she has been an assistant professor of political science at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. She's currently finishing a book on democracy pain, French liberalism, and the politics of suffrage, a title which naturally begs the question, is there such a thing as a tame tiger? Uh, and tonight, however, she's going to be discussing two of the great tiger tamers of democracy, uh, Benjamin Constant, uh, see the Tokyo and the relationship between commerce and citizenship in the works of those two authors. So I hope you will join me in welcoming Professor Ed. Okay, thank you to uh, Alan for the invitation. Uh, thank you to the Benson Center for hosting this. Um, had some really impressive people come through. So I was glad to be invited to join those ranks. Um, and thanks especially to everybody joining on Zoom. Uh, it's always impressive, I think, when you can get an audience for French liberalism of the 19th century. So we'll see if it, see if it lives up to your expectations. Um, so despite the words in the title of the talk, I don't want to start with either liberalism or commerce. Um, but actually, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so I don't want to start with any of these words actually, um, but with months. Um, and though I'm going to spend most of my time in this talk in the 19th century and on the two figures, uh, Benjamin Constant and Alexis de Tocqueville, their takes on democracy, I do want to begin with some uh, more recent assessments of democracy, democracy in the present day. So today it's common to hear from everywhere that democracy is on the decline. Uh, last year, Freedom House Index found that authoritarianism is on the rise, democracy on the decline. So we have some empirical metrics about this. And from this premise that democracy is descending, declining, it doesn't take us long to find some arguments from philosophers uh, that find one cause of democracy's failure in us, its people, its citizens. Um, citizens of Western democracy, we hear in books like these two, uh, to put it lightly, are lacking. Irrational, biased, prone to errors in judgment. The citizens who make up democracies can never hope, we hear, to choose policies that are responsive, lasting, rational, just, or at the very least, to vote for candidates who would choose those kind of policies for them. Some academics have uh, also recently concluded that democracy deserves to fail. So Jason Brennan's book, uh, is very much against democracy. Um, and in fact, some of these academics argue, the correct solution to solving some of that, uh, democracy's problems might be scaling back who can participate. That is, who ought to possess the right to vote um, in order to shape the policies um, behind democracy. So the solution to democracy's failures, according to some, is to have less of it. But, uh, these are certainly not new problems. And in fact, one thing I want to argue is that democracies by their nature face a problem of political judgment or citizen competence. Well-functioning democratic institutions need citizens who know what good functioning institutions are. Who are, uh, to just name a few virtues, well-informed, rational, civic-minded, open-minded, moderate, Pick your virtue and could go on. But democracies also face a trade off. So, democracies probably cannot exist without these right kind of citizens. And yet, if we restrict that citizenry, meaning those who get to go to the polls, to the right kinds of citizens, we undermine other values that we might deem necessary for a regime to qualify as democratic at all. Some of those values, inclusiveness, universality among them. Everyone has the right to vote. This is part of the essence of democracy in the modern world. And in this talk, I want to examine similar questions about democracy and citizen judgment 
as they were addressed in what looks like a distant time and a strange place. And that's the context of France in the 19th century. And in particular, I wanna examine a series of arguments by thinkers who were dedicated to the preservation of free and functioning institutions, but not necessarily democratic. And in fact, we'll look at some arguments by thinkers who believe that the two were at odds, free institutions and democratic groups. And in particular, these thinkers tried to make sense of the emergence of demands for democracy in the form of calls for a wider suffrage, more people enfranchised. And as we'll learn, they did so without regard for those democratic values um, like inclusivity and universality that I just said. So one thing to establish, this is a political world where universal suffrage had to be established and defended, not one in which it was the default. And all of the figures that I'll discuss here, Constant and Tocqueville being the primary two, identified as liberal, a term I'll return to later in the lecture. So in response to these demands for more democracy, liberals addressed one of the central issues facing France after the revolution. And this I'm going to call the suffrage question. And this was the question of who ought to possess the right to vote and on what basis. So notice there's already a sense that there are prerequisites for this right. We'll get, we'll get to this later. And just as importantly, who should not possess that right, who falls below a certain threshold in order to possess um, the political right to vote. And the idea behind even asking this question, which might seem a bit foreign to us, is that for the sake of well-ordered institutions, especially in a society prone to recent revolution, and I'm referring here uh, mostly to the revolution of 1789, and to despotism, referring here to the despotism of Bonaparte, the suffrage had to be restricted to those who would use it well. And so from at least 1814 to, we can argue this, uh, at least the 1840s, universal manhood suffrage was not seen as a serious proposal for France. Restricted suffrage, most liberals believed, would avoid the irrationalities, the revolutionary tendencies, the bad preferences associated with democracy. Everything we hear now, in discussions about the failures of citizens. And liberals believed that we would do well to filter out those irrationalities and bad preferences before they ever made their way into politics by restricting the suffrage from the beginning. So in other words, control those preferences before elections even happen. So in this lecture, I wanna consider two uh, answers to the suffrage question from Constant and from Tokyo. And I focus on these two in the landscape of liberalism for two reasons. One is that uh, I think they're both recognizable at this point as being part of the canon of liberalism, um, and especially in the, in the Anglo, uh, in the English speaking world. What's interesting about them though, is uh, they're rarely placed side by side. Part of this is because um, Tocqueville himself never responded directly to anything that Poulson wrote. Uh, Tocqueville actually said he learned more by not responding to his predecessor's ideas, which is like a lazy way of not doing a lit review, I think. But he said he learned more that way. Um, and second, the second reason I want to focus on them, most directly for our purposes, both of these figures wrestled with the emergence of a new form of society. Holmstone referred to this society most often as commercial, and Tocqueville referred to this new society most often as democratic. But as we'll see in the lecture, um, these two terms and really what they meant are blurred, I think, in each of their work. And really importantly, both sought an answer to that suffrage question, French politics, who ought to vote. Both sought an answer that was fitting uh, of the commercial democratic conditions under which they lived. So they believed that part of the answer to this question of who should vote should come from studying the condition of society, democratic or commercial. And Tocqueville in particular, I'm going to argue, complicated everything I've just said about French liberals and their hesitancy or their resistance to democracy. Oh, there they were. I forgot that I had them up there. 
So Constant, um, notice that um, there's really not a lot of overlap in their lives. Tocqueville is uh, journeying to America after Constant's death. But now we very much place the two as part of this French liberal tradition. So just to um, go over what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to uh, sort of fill in this argument about how French liberals approached democracy, really how they defined it, and then talk about their anxieties over its emergence. Then I'm going to look in detail at two different responses uh, to the way that liberals define democracy. Constant first with his property-centric view of the citizen. So Constant, as we'll learn, argued that uh, citizenship should be, the right to vote should be restricted on the basis of property. And as we'll learn, this was a view that he based on the commercial conditions of modern society. Constant, in fact, envisioned a constantly changing mobile class of proprietors and therefore of voters. And these were changes that he believed followed the arrival of the age of population. So Constant, I want to argue, represents in some ways liberals past against democracy, but also and he presents a theory that looks ahead to a more inclusive franchise. Tocqueville, on the other hand, uh, offered an educational, uh, an argument for the educational function that rights themselves could serve. Unlike most of his predecessors, Constant included, who were sort of uh, consumed in searching for these prerequisites for the right to vote, Tocqueville did learn something from the Americans' example of what could be gained from the individual's exercise of political rights. And in examining Constant and Tocqueville together, I want to shed some light on their individual ideas about the age of commerce and the age of democracy. But I aim to show this neglected side of liberalism as well, a liberalism that wasn't entirely or categorically opposed to political democracy or to the extension of the franchise. And in putting them together, I want to note how they made these arguments by examining how the progress of commerce and of democracy had altered society such that it should also alter French politics. And finally, also, I'll conclude with some uh, comments about what I think Tocqueville's legacy in particular might offer us for this perennial problem of judgment under democracies. Okay, so liberals in this period shared uh, and almost, almost haunting worry about what democracy would bring. So Tocqueville himself writes his democracy as the waters of a flood. And this was actually a common image that liberals uh, used at the time. Others wrote about democracy in full flow. This image of having a sense of something that cannot be held back, but possibly could be channeled given the right features. But when they talked about uh, democracy's deluge, they really meant it in a particular way. What could not be held back, in fact, was democracy as a social state, as a form of society. And what they um, really tried to keep separate from democracy in that sense was democracy in, as a political regime. So liberals embraced the first idea that democracy itself was a form of society, a social state. But they did not believe that there was any obvious symmetry between the social state of democracy and democracy as a political regime type. Or we might take for granted, oh, there's a, there's a symmetry of democracy in, in the social sphere into politics. Liberals really tried to resist this idea. And the idea of this, of the social state might be familiar to some of us, from the work of Alexis de Tocqueville, especially uh, volume one or the 1835 democracy. A social state, Tocqueville writes, is commonly the result of circumstances, sometimes of laws, often or still of these two causes united. Wherever it exists, he writes, it may justly be considered as the source of almost all the laws the usages and the ideas which regulate the conduct of nations. It is therefore necessary if we would become acquainted with legislation and manners to begin with the study of the social state. And this, uh, this comment about the Anglo-American social state structures most of the 1835 democracy in America, but it was also emblematic of French liberals' approach to the study of democracy. The social state, they believed, was prior to and was really a cause of 
political institutions. It determined and delimited what was possible in the political sphere. And for Tocqueville and for other French liberals, the social state was defined by an equality of conditions. Now, to be clear, this wasn't a material equality, and it certainly, as we'll learn, was not a political equality, but they really defined democracy in contrast to the fixed world of aristocracy, where society was divided on the basis of uh, one's land or title. And while liberals thought that this was inevitable, this was here, this was the flood, they did not believe that democracy as a political regime type had to be embraced. And by this, by democracy as a political regime, they really meant a type of regime um, supported by the principle of popular sovereignty that manifested in universal suffrage. When I say universal suffrage here in this talk, I am uh, talking about universal male suffrage. Um, no one in France except some on the fringes in the 1840s are even talking about uh, women's suffrage. So what's wrong with it? Well, as one liberal Ray Cuillard writes in 1831, it is nothing but anarchy, tyranny, misery, bankruptcy, and despotism. So to put it lightly, democracy's equality in the social state, liberals believe, ought not translate directly into the political sphere. The second way that this distinction appears was in distinctions between types of rights. So liberals believe that what we now call civil rights, things like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, religious freedom, right to a trial by jury, uh, what many of them wrote as the inviolable right of private property, Many liberals believed that these were um, rights that extended universally. And they actually regarded this as one of the salutary features of democracy as a social state. These rights now extended to everyone, regardless of title. At the same time, the right to vote, or the political right, we called it, um, was of a different kind. This was a right that had to be earned. And it was a right that had to be earned, liberals thought, by possessing certain qualities, characteristics, or capacities for the vote. The result of this was a restricted franchise. So equality in the social sphere, equality and universality in the extension of civil rights, but um, the right to vote they thought was really just of a different kind, had a different status. What do I mean by a limited franchise? How limited was it? Depends on when you ask. But for example, in 1817, um, the uh, electoral laws enfranchised about 90,000 men out of a population of 30 million, those who could meet a taxation threshold. So this is the, this is the uh, context the debate that both Constant and Tocqueville are to some degree wading into. And Constant uh, talks about this in his 1810 uh, Principles of Politics. And Constant began where many of his liberal contemporaries did. Nations make necessary distinctions. Uh, no nation, he says, has ever regarded all of the individuals in its territory uh, as members of the political association. Even the most complete democracy, he says, establishes different categories, foreigners, uh, those below an age of maturity. <laughs> there is therefore a principle, he says, according to which we have to make these distinctions. Some distinctions, like those we continue to make, are made on behalf of residency, um, on the basis of age, on the basis of which side of the Rio Grande you happen to be born on, in the case of being in Texas. But for Constant, <laughs> this principle, this regulating principle of suffrage, uh, was property ownership. Only owners can be citizens, he writes in the same text. And this was a thesis he believed particularly applicable to France in 1810, to the society, the social state that he observed. Property ownership, in fact, we can think of as an external sign of one's internal fitness uh, to exercise political rights. And so what did ownership signal? What was this supposed to be a sign of? Holstone argues at some points uh, in, a, in a Lockean style argument 
that private property was essential to the overall improvement of a society. All of mankind, like Locke says, is improved by the individual's private ownership. And therefore, for, for Fonfon, anyone who engages in this practice of social improvement uh, ought to be counted among the citizenry. But beyond the point about its social benefit, Constant maintained that the ownership of property enhanced necessary qualities in the individual that ought to be brought into politics through the suffrage. And ownership was an external sign of those internal qualities. And I put a few um, up here. There's different ways we can disentangle his argument for this. But the first is that um, property ownership fosters a shared interest in society. So having an economic stake gives one a wider interest uh, in what happens really beyond one's household. The second is Constance as an informed outlook. So for much of the work, he draws a straight line from personal interests to an understanding of society's interests. The property owner, he believed, would uh, by this process of ownership become an informed citizen. And the next was a soundness of judgment. The quality that went hand in hand with an informed outlook judgment uh, cultivated and developed. And the latter two, he says, are in particular the result of leisure. Property ownership frees you up to become more informed about politics and to develop the degree of political judgment you saw as a citizen. Well, on the other side of this, remember I said, for the suffrage question, it's just as important who is left out because this shows us both sides of the standard for sending the right to vote. Constant says, uh, while proprietor citizens, this is uh, the term he uses to uh, distinguish those who possess the right to vote, have that interest plus uh, good political judgment characterized by leisure. On the other side, we have residents, the non-property described in this. And he says they're not without virtue. They've got a patriotism. And it's a patriotism, he says, that befits ages prior to the age of, uh, of commerce, the age of conquest, the age of war. But this is not what's necessary uh, to vote in the 19th century. And at least where political rights were concerned, Constant ranked this patriotism below the understanding of interests, uh, at least regarding the extension of rights. So notice here, property for Constant established a legitimate material inequality and therefore legitimate distinctions in society that had to be reflected in its politics. And notice also what's happening here. Constant is reaffirming that distinction we talked about earlier between different types of rights, civil and political. Civil safeguards are open to all, he says, residents as well as citizens. Political rights, however, bestow power, and this is the difference. Civil safeguards you can think of as being defensive. Political rights, he says, uh, extending them to the non-property, quote, would not bestow a shield, but an offensive weapon. So why was Constant, however, so keen to reserve political rights to the property? Part of it is um, what he saw as one of the social costs of the commercial age. And this uh, was the tendency of, of the commercial age to encourage a kind of privatism, kind of atomization. And Constant writes, absorbed in the enjoyment of our private independence and in the pursuit of our particular interests, we should surrender our right to share in political power too easily. So Constant is concerned with this uh, surrendering, right? So caught up in uh, what Adam Smith earlier called uh, bottles and trinkets, we would eventually relinquish uh, political rights, or at least uh, take much less interest in politics than we ought to. So notice Constant is looking for a political class that's capable of linking private enjoyments um, with this kind of public sphere, and he sees that in the proprietor class. So much of what I've said so far conveys the sense that Constant was describing a static society, one divided between property and non-property with a fixed electorate. 
But in fact, Holmes Knowles comes to have a dynamic theory of property and of the property class. One again dependent on his descriptions of the age of commerce. Holmes Knowles writes, since the birth of commerce, proprietors have no longer formed a distinct class, separated from the rest of men by lasting prerogatives. The membership of this class renews itself constantly. Some people leave, others enter it. If property were immobile, it always stayed in the same hands. It would be a most improper institution. So notice that for Constant, the legitimacy of property as an institution stems in part from the fact of its circulation in the commercial age. And as a consequence of these new social conditions, a natural system of freely circulating land allowed for political power in property without aristocratic privilege. Remember, the aristocratic age is gone, replaced by that democratic social state. So seen in this light, Constant's conception of the proprietor citizen too takes on a new cast. An ever-renewing property class translates into an evolving electorate, a body which, to quote him, some enter, others leave. Constant therefore did envision a, a society whose uh, suffrage remained divided on the basis of ownership, but also a future in which the electorate would expand as property changed hands as a result of commerce, and even as he would come to write years later, especially in the year of his death, 1830, of industrialization. And in 1830, in fact, just months before his death, Constant defended the existence of working class organizations and associations against the middle class July monarchy's prohibitions against them, citing the universal rights of all residents in the nation to discuss its politics. I'm happy to talk about that uh, in the Q&A. So Tocqueville shared, uh, people who are familiar with, with uh, democracy in America will see a lot of similarities between Tocqueville's anxieties uh, about democracy's deluge and some of Constant's anxieties about the commercial age. So uh, Tocqueville in fact shared, I'm going to call it Constant's ambivalence toward the changes introduced into society by commerce and democracy. And he was famously alarmed by the problem of atomism, the tendency of human beings to retreat into themselves that followed these, develop these developments. And Tocqueville too wrote of the tendency of individuals to withdraw into a private pursuit of wealth and work without an interest in public affairs. And in fact, I think we can read all of, especially the 1835 democracy, with this question of citizen judgment uh, in mind, I think it really structures the entire the entirety of the 1835 text. How can we cultivate citizen judgment and interest in a society democratic and commercial? Tocqueville writes at the introduction to democracy in America that he's seen democracy spreading across France, and no one there has done a very good job of responding to it. Everyone was ill prepared, he said. And so I think we can read this entire text in some ways as a discussion of democratic judgment. Um, unlike Constant, though, Tocqueville didn't turn to leisure as an answer um, for the outward signs of a citizen's inner judgment. There were times um, when he's especially in the Chamber of Deputies after 1839, what he does uh, reconsider, revote for a property qualification. But as Tocqueville noted in the 1840 democracy, the life of the leisured class was passing away. This is what the commercial age meant to him. Uh, he writes in uh, this 1840 volume, uh, part two, chapter 18, everybody he says in America works for a living. And this is what France is going to, uh, this is what's going to happen in France soon. And if everyone's working for a living, where do we get the leisured class, those who are free enough to engage in political rights? The question then was how could a nation deal with these social circumstances? So what did Tocqueville look on and think did not work? Um, at least by 1847, Tocqueville comes around to the idea that the way that the French have been restricting their suffrage uh, is not doing anything for either its politics or its social state. I'm sure Alan has some things to say about this, actually. 
So Tocqueville writes in 1847, this is on the eve of the revolution of 1848, which I'm sure Alan is going to ask about. The laws have narrowly confined the exercise of political rights uh, to a narrow class. Who is this narrow single class? It's those who could meet that property threshold. So to give you a sense in 1831, the property threshold a little more uh, progressive than the one I mentioned before, enfranchises about 200,000 men. Uh, by 1847, uh, thanks to changing circumstances, about 240,000 in the population of 30 million. And Tocqueville looks upon this. Not only does he say that we are sleeping on a slumbering volcano because of it, but he says that what has happened with the restricted suffrage is that uh, French political life has become kind of listless. It's monotonous. It's one note. It's weak. In the political world, he says, defined like this, one can hardly expect to find movement, fecundity, or life. Um, so Tocqueville finds French politics as a result of this as enervated, weak. And sort of implicit behind some of the critiques, he's criticizing the July government for failing to see what Pinkstone had described decades earlier, that the commercial age had altered the boundaries of society and therefore ought to redraw some of the boundaries of that voting citizenry as well. And in fact, as part of these critiques and throughout the really the mid 1840s, Tocqueville writes, the government had given its restricted suffrage, really accelerated those processes of citizen apathy and atomization to which a democratic social state was already from. So those tendencies that he saw in society those things that alarmed him about democracy ultimately end up getting amplified because the suffrage, uh, at least at, at the time of 1847, he deems to be so narrow. So what was his response? So let me uh, preface this by saying Tocqueville himself, in this period we're discussing, does not advocate universal suffrage for friends um, for a lot of reasons. We can talk about them later. But at the very least, he learns something from America that complicates France's distinctions, their liberals' distinctions at least. The first distinction between that universality of civil rights and the necessarily restricted character of political rights. Tocqueville doesn't go so far as to say, look, this is a meaningless distinction, but he does observe something in America that at least he acknowledges gives him pause as to uh, what's been happening in France. So he observes the political rights that the American uses, uses so much, in fact, are called to him constantly and in a thousand ways that he lives in society. He first gets involved in the general interest by necessity and then by choice. So Tocqueville is saying here that the political rights that he sees exercised in America are not so bad. And in fact, at one point, he says that universal suffrage seems to have worked there. They don't have constant violence and revolution as a result of what happens at the ballot box. So Tocqueville is at least acknowledging here um, that political rights themselves, their exercise, can promote that interest that liberals searched for in all of those, um, in all of those arguments about a restricted suffrage. The second way that he's sort of complicating this is he's complicating the distinction between democracy's social state and democracy as a political regime. So this is, um, you might be surprised by this. This is a distinction that Tocqueville's kind of famous for. And this is one reason that reading in democracy and uh, reading democracy in America for most people is so difficult to understand at first, right? He's talking about most of the time democratic society and only democratic politics secondary. But in the 1840 volume, Tocqueville looks back at France, as he always does in the book. And he says, many people in France consider democracy's equality of conditions as a first evil. And many did, right? Worried, at least there's some trepidation about what it means. And political liberty is its second. And here, this is from uh, the same passage where he's talking about political rights. People think, oh, our first evil is that democracy's equality has come. Our second one, let's not elevate that evil to French politics. And Tocqueville says, as for me, 
to say that to combat the evils that democratic society can produce, there is only one effective remedy, political liberty. So Tocqueville, at the very least, is open to the American suggestion um, that perhaps there might be a solution to democracy's tendencies and more democracy. And in fact, in one place, he says, I've observed that the way to remedy the dangers of democracy is to go to the other democratic extreme, maybe more democracy, ultimately helps to fix what the French have been so anxious about. So in this, he's at least um, complicating that notion that the social state and the political regime had to be kept so separate. Um, Tocqueville's legacies um, get carried on in France in a number of different figures. I don't love to put out a ton of names, so if you have questions, we can talk about them. But you know, his most famous uh, legacy, the one that we know him for in the United States, the one he praises, is that legacy of civil associations. Other figures in France at the time pick up the mantle of Tocqueville and try to establish the French, French versions of associations and organizations, some of them specifically with an eye um, toward educating uh, citizens, educating universal suffrage, they say, which comes to France in 1848. Um, some liberals established worker subscription libraries. Uh, the Franklin Society, in fact, was a society that delivered public lectures to the working classes and women, believing right, that the exercise of political rights itself was interest building, judgment building, and this was a supplement to that notion. Um, other figures pick up the notion that maybe the political party isn't quite pulling its weight either. And in a series of interesting arguments, like so they find if, uh, if the exercise of political rights can itself be elevating or itself foster judgment, they speak of the political party as a kind of spare government, an alternative, a, a diverse set of views against what the government is promoting, something that citizens can hear and take in and respond to. And still others speak of the party as a kind of educational institution. It seems like we're very, very far from this. But the notion that the political party could do a kind of pre-filtering of platforms, policies, opinions. And really, I like to think of it as lowering the cost of kind of citizens' cognitive judgment, right? Presenting things in a more concise way, uh, presenting information, policies, platforms um, in a way that at least some figures thought would be more digestible, more educational, more educative. So one of the stories I've tried to tell here, sort of triangulating the story of liberalism, commercial society, and democratic society, is a story about democracy and liberalism, or liberal democracy, that I think isn't the standard one, right? We hear liberal democracy, we think, how do we keep democracies more free? And that certainly was part of liberals' concern here. But liberals were also concerned with making democracy better, making it smarter, making it more competent, uh, making it, at the very least, uh, not descend into revolution. So liberalism here is kind of a democracy-enhancing project. By shaping its citizenry liberal thought, um, we can sort of shape the character of politics, improve it. So going back to the very beginning of the talk, this huge problem of citizen judgment remains uh, very much with us. Um, some, in fact, as we learn, would have us return to kind of a 21st or adopt the 21st century version of that suffrage question. Who should possess political rights and who should not? So the question is, is there anything to be learned from the 19th century for now? And I'm not a, uh, I'm not a contemporary political theorist or an analytic philosopher, but let me offer a few suggestions. Um, the first one is that, as Tocqueville saw, these kind of political distinctions are really, uh, really very much a political dead end. Tocqueville writes, this leaves political life listless, enervated, weakened. And it's not diversity. Notice it's not diversity that Tocqueville's privileging here. It's that political life ceases to be a vibrant activity in which people want to join, one captured really by the interests of a single section of society. 
And I think one of Tocqueville's points in democracy in America, and it's, it's certainly implicit and it's under the surface, is that we kind of have to get creative with this project of citizenship. One creative option was that option of parties that I mentioned before, these kind of elite led institutions, like I said, that can package information in clear ways, things that can lower the cost of participation. At the very least, it would be nice to have election day off or midterm election day off. And so I think one of the big messages, especially Tobila ends us with, leaves us with, uh, at the end of considering the question of democracy, is that rather than trying to limit, trying to work um, directly on the mind of the individual, but feels calling on a lot of our institutions, I think, to pick up the slack. So I'll leave it there. And I will uh, take your questions. Thank you guys. Okay, I will start with a, a question from our, our live audience. And someone would like to raise their hand. Okay. Great. Um, I had a question on kind of the last one on, on whether there's a goal for these people. So it seems like all this conversation about uh, what makes people qualify to vote uh, has to do with what the goal is of society. Aristotle has this discussion of yeah. you know, democracy, the qualification of freedom, the quality of society's freedom, and all the rest as well, and then aristocracy of virtue. So, to what extent is that? Question. That's a great point. And also, I should say that um, a lot of Tolstoy's discussion of leisure really calls to mind Aristotle's point about uh, how much time is necessary in order, how much free time is necessary in order really to be a good citizen of Tolstoy. But I think to answer your question directly, there's a few things that are in the background. I would put them as um, this is almost kind of like a liberalism of fear. So the goal in a lot of ways is like avoiding the worst rather than getting the best. So what is the worst? Um, this is a generation, especially called Sons generation, that saw revolution, despotism, and experienced the terror. And in all of these liberal writings, that's in the front. That's what we don't want. And the belief is that allowing all of these irrationalities of the politics with the mass vote really just perpetuates uh, the possibility of those things occurring again. So all of these, for all of these liberals, really the forefront of their mind is um, this, uh, this revolutionary tendency. Um, they also thought that uh, really popular sovereignty itself emboldened that tendency, seeing yourself as sovereign, right? Seeing the people as sovereign. And of course they saw this, uh, this taken to an it's extreme of the terror. So rather than putting it uh, really, especially for Colston as a positive goal, I see it as something that liberals are trying to run away from. Now for Tocqueville, I think um, maybe especially in the 1835 democracy, we can see some positive things. There. So he says at the beginning of the text, um, you know, no one has, has really managed democracy well in Europe, but he does think that a democracy can be elevated, he says. So I think for him, uh, at the very least, there might be a positive goal. There's something, something like the preservation of civil rights or individual freedom. But for Kunstmann, it's certainly a liberalism up there. And would you say that uh, the commercial idea makes the idea of freedom and you want to talk to the media? Um, I think they're both of two minds on this, right? So Kunstmann clearly thinks, you know, this changes conditions so much that um, we're no longer in the in the age of conquest, right? So it opens up all new possibilities. Um, Tocqueville is kind of a, I think, very much of two minds. So he sees a lot to praise in the commercial age as kind of a means for getting freedom. But there's always, with Tocqueville, there's always like this push-pull tendency. At the same time, commerce and uh, commerce in some ways invites the opposite of despotism because it makes us so private, so apathetic. That this invites the possibility of unfreedom. So I, I see both of them as very, you know, they're very much pulled in two directions on both the question of commerce and the question of democracy. Yeah. I will ask one of the questions uh, on behalf of our uh, Zoom audience. Uh, in, in your view, Professor Engler, which of these two subjects of today's lecture are more represented in the current state of politics in the United States? The two being commerce and citizenship. Uh, commerce. 
two subjects. My guess is Pascal and Tokyo, but oh. it could be Thomas. Okay, and, and which, of the two, which of the two is more representative? Exactly. Um, you know, I like to think, you know, as Americans, I think we like to think that we live in Tocqueville's world, right? We take, I think, I heard you talking earlier to somebody writing a paper about Tocqueville's appropriations in America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that most of us, like Tocqueville, want democracy to work. I would put Tocqueville among all the French liberals as being maybe the most uh, positive about democracy's outcomes. Um, so of the two, I think we're, we're living more in Tocqueville's world. Um, so at the same time, you know, one of the reasons that I think this period is so interesting is that a lot of these kind of distinctions about uh, citizenship haven't entirely gone away. We do have universal suffrage, but we often draw these more implicit distinctions about, you know, what kind of people do you want to be? What kind of people uh, ought to be here? Who doesn't merit being here and on what basis? So in that respect, I think some of the citizenship immigration conversation speaks a little bit more to so I didn't choose one, but that's why I guess I have a problem, right? I didn't choose one. I mean, you're taking the parts of both. Traditional political theory. Yeah, right. Um, yes. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I guess this is a question about the more directed towards you, but uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in the question of how people are interested in the question of 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 the lead judgment is going to be better, I guess. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what's the basis for that? Because I, mean, I think of like Hume on like the pathology of intellectuals, and um, or you think Thomas Sowell on intellectual yeah. Raymond society. Or something. Um, yeah, the yeah. opium of the intellectuals. Yeah. I don't think I don't think intellectuals have a great history of like, being right about a lot in terms of like practical political judgments, and so. I, mean, I think one of the great virtues of democracy is like one of the great virtues of uh, you know free market. You know, but, um, uh, maybe, maybe it's maybe we need less. I mean, I'm, I am a philosopher myself, so I mean, I'm so, so, uh, but I'm, I'm just not I'm not convinced. I think yeah. we have a role, but I'm not convinced our role is like to shape politics. Yeah. And I think when we try to, we usually do a really bad job. Of yeah. It. Um, and so I, there's sort of a background assumption here. And it's sort of there in the, in the Brennan book as well. Um, yeah. But I just, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't buy it. You know, like, like, why well, think that, you know, these elites are going to like know what they're talking about? Most of what they do is like epistemic trespassing where they, you know, they, they, they claim to know more about things than they do. And by, by nature of things, politics is like, uh, it's like, uh, it's beyond like what any one individual can, you know, like, no one individual can grasp all parts of the political order. Yeah. So you need these feedback loops from like the citizens, you know, from people who are affected by policies. And I think that's that's one of the beauties of democracy. So I guess I'm just like skeptical of the whole background premise that they're operating with. Maybe you could maybe give a defense of them or yeah. say, say your own. Let me let me say a little more. So so first of all, let me say I, I think I agree with you a lot. The way that I usually teach, uh, especially uh, John Stuart Mill on probability. Is to say, you know, I studied political theory, but I know nothing. I know almost nothing, right, about practical politics. I have no idea how to balance a budget. I don't know much about defense spending. So I'm not sure that arguments like that work. So I think I sympathize with this. Let me um, kind of, one thing that you said that I just wanted to hinge on, you know, this idea that it's it's intellectual that's doing this. But notice that, especially for somebody like Constant, it's decidedly not intellectual. Or the leisure class. Yeah, so. it's, it's, it's so, so there is a leisure class element here. But he does think that there's something about like having having had your hands dirty with ownership, with proprietorship, that bestows a kind of judgment on you. And I think in that way it is a little bit more democratic, right? So and notice he doesn't say, hey, we need this elevated like Archimedean point from which to look down on politics. He says, you know, you sort of become a, a better judge of politics by having an interest in it, actually being in it. So while I do think there, you know, there are a lot of arguments floating out there about an epistocracy that's a model really is. And it does seem like this is an intellectual class. But I don't think either of these thinkers, and I don't think or a lot Twitter of the Twitter class. Yeah, yeah, the Twitter class. Yeah, class. yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. I don't think that really Constant Tokyo or I mean I can I can probably think of some on the margins. The the loudest liberal voices in this conversation in this period. We're not saying that this is this is the task of intellectuals. Now, doesn't mean it's not the task of a certain kind of elite, right? But it's not it's not the academic elite, certainly. 
Um, there's some virtue, I think, to kind of be, being in politics or both, being, being in society, being part of it, rather than trying to be in an ivory tower looking down on the both. So I, I think, I, I mean, I agree in large part. I think if they, if they were here, they would have been so part of this, but. I feel pretty patriotic about the role of the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the old regime, this is something that we. Uh, I have another question from, from Zoom Lab. Uh, the idea of the mobility of proprietorship is stymied by inheritance, conglomerations, and the distinction yes. between the life of a corporation and the death of its original owners. Did Constant or Tocqueville have thoughts on this? Yes. So um, Constant thought that what we wanted was actually, uh, it just rang a bell, the words he used was he envisioned a world free from, quote, monopoly privilege, he says. So he is, wor he is worried about, I think, what the, the um, person who posed that question, that kind of corporation, modern corporation, right? Modern inheritance. So really importantly, um, Constant saw virtue in proprietorship, but he was a staunch enemy of the ultra-royalist aristocracy in his time. So um, he sees the virtue of the small proprietor, the proprietor, again, that question about interests. But he says, this ought not lock us in to an aristocratic uh, class, right? A fixed aristocratic class. And he's vehement. In England, it's the ultra, it's sort of the, their version of the ultra royalists. In France, it's the ultra royalists who are destroying liberty. So Constant is very concerned about this. Um, Tocqueville himself, uh, has a chapter in the section of democracy in America uh, about inheritance. Uh, there, he, there ought not be, he says, a class of um, sort of the generational wealth in the United States. So both of them are very attuned to this, and I think they're very attuned to it because of their experience. Liberals are, and, and especially in Constant's uh, restoration, rely uh, a lot against uh, the ultra royalists. So this is something they're very attuned to as well. This monopoly on privilege. And one reason for this is that um, privilege is not suited to democratic social condition. This is this is the law stage. This is the old regime, and so they're both very keen, I think, uh, very attuned to the same similar problems. I will uh, use this moment to yeah. exercise my privilege and ask a question of my own. Uh, not about 1848, though. Okay. Uh, so that'll be for dinner. Right. I know it's going to come. Right. So. so <laughs> For Tocqueville, the Americans are the most politically educated people in the world. They don't get this education by leisure. They get this through activity of all kinds. I'm sure that you know today's Americans are just as active and just as unleisured as the Americans of Tocqueville's era. Uh, are they equally politically educated? I mean, there seems to be two possible answers here. Either Tocqueville was wrong and these people really weren't very politically educated, or else you have seen a decline in American political education. So which of these is true and how would you explain? So, you know, one thing I think that kind of gets lost in this translation here, so much of what Tocqueville's writing about is, you know, local liberties, local politics mm -hmm. of the township, mm -hmm. right? He's saying this is where that political education comes. And I don't know about people here. I mean, I, I don't think many of us think in those terms anymore, right? Um, I think a lot of us are concerned with national politics, national issues. That's where that's where uh, citizens come in, right? That's where judgment happens. That's where you know presidential elections. That's where the action happens. But you know, I think Tocqueville is looking at um, Americans of the 19th century are much more involved in uh, actually getting to use the phrase before getting their hands dirty in local politics. What does he say? The American had takes an interest in this township because. Uh, that's where he kind of mixes himself to return to another local metaphor. So I don't know that it's exactly like an, an, an issue of how educated we are versus then, maybe more of an issue of where we participate now versus then. Stoke believes that uh, where does that educated function of rights come from? It comes from the practice of local liberties, which again, you know, is a, is a response to what's happening in France. Uh, why is it that the Americans' local liberties are so valued for Tocqueville? Um, because those of the French have been corrupted. And to this very day, I saw considerably less. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm struggling with the whole idea. I love the history, and we have to know where we come from. But in today's world, especially with 
the media isn't where how do you how do you even find a rational mind when most people are not even educated by you know their local politics they are educated by six major networks that are all owned by the same corporation yeah so so where do you get a rational mind with that and i think that there's just um you know so many issues about elections that have to do more with who's controlling the elections than deciding whether someone has a property or not yep. um the, the only the only issue with with voter rights i think right now is we're in new york where they're allowing non-citizens to have the right to vote um that, that's a huge topic that's a, that's a local person. but other than that i think that the, that the media like i said how do you even begin to get a rational mind when, when people are inundated with very biased plans that are new yeah um i don't have a great answer for that let me tell you let me let me share some of what i think just with what you said resonated with some of the history i know so one thing i should say is in addition to the things I've said about voting rights here, liberals talked a lot about how elections should be structured. And a huge concern of theirs, especially, was a, sort of avoiding the what we would now think of corrupt elections, who's controlling it. So that's the other side of this story that I still have time to talk about. Um, they argued, uh, well, most of them, but they accepted, argued against indirect elections, where, where elections are mediated, because that invites corruption. So that's on their radar as well. The other thing on their radar is the issue of a free press. In fact, um, all of them in different ways said, for democracy to work, the press must be free. Um, now, that's a question. What is it? What is it, what constitutes a free press in today's society? Like you said these networks are owned by uh, conglomerates that have their own agendas. Um, I don't have a great. I don't have a great answer to this question. We can talk later, but. Uh, I just want to flag that some of these issues are also on their radar at the time. They've seen their own version of corruption. They've seen their own version, uh, vote for their own violations of press freedom. These are things they're worried about. Yes, I have another question from our, our Zoom audience. Um, do you have any suggestions on media sources that would allow comparison of liberalism of Tokyo and Palestine with current affairs? Um, you can read my book when it comes out. I mean, am I allowed to say that? I don't know. I don't know. I've never said that. But, um, you know, I there are um, there are some, especially um, the Liberty Fund website has a lot of sources on there. They've got a lot of primary source material. I mean, my advice for all this is, I think we should read the primary sources. Um, that's just me, right? Let's read Cole Stone and Tocqueville instead of reading uh, an academic secondhand account of them. So you can read my book when it comes out. But the Liberty Fund website has these texts there for free. Holmstone's Principles is there. The two volume Democracy in America is there. Um, and then draw some of your own connections. I would rather that people read the primary sources than go searching for something else. But you can send me an email if you want to you know, look for some other things. Yeah. Uh, I, I got here late, so sorry. But I'm just trying to pick up some kind of thread here. Uh, is is it possible that what commerce is doing uh, by creating different trades and different uh, different perspectives on reality uh, that it is kind of lubricating a process of creating more paradoxes and dichotomies from which society can evolve? Mm -hmm. So because commerce makes more varied ways of yeah. life, we get more diversity now. Right. Um, but, but then again, it's probably a, a, you know, a yeah. process that goes back and forth. Yeah. So now we can get to a point where we're getting provincial again, yeah. but that's part of this process. I, I think that's one way to characterize something of what's happening in the background of these thinkers. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about how some of them say, uh, you know, with, with the arrival of commerce, they said it's about both commerce and democracy. We have more individuals now, than before, which I think captures your idea. There's more diverse ways of life now, there's more trades. And in fact, uh, these thinkers only really began to talk about the emergence of a true middle class because of commercial society. 
that before it's it's the nobles and the common people. Um, at the same time, though, like you're saying, they recognize all of these social changes at the same time always have costs. This is how they always they always operate. Um, and that cost is that retreat. If I'm if I'm so um, so wrapped up in the pursuit of wealth, there might be other things that are left aside. But, you know, diversity, regardless, right? Diversity might exist. Um, those different ways of life might exist, but then the question I think for both of them is, you know, what do I do with them? <laughs> if I don't bring them into politics in any way, mm -hmm. there's really no value to it. So I, I sort of see some of what you're describing in the background of, of both of them. I have another internet question for you, and this is if you'd like to say something about some of the differences between the first and second volumes of Democracy in America. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, the 1835 volume, uh, you know, really starts off with that discussion of the social state. I guess I should say I often really treat them as two separate books. I usually say the 1835 and the 1840 volume. Uh, some people are probably going to be angry about me for that, but I usually treat them as two separate books. <laughs> um, the 1835 volume really starts off with this idea of the, you know, the social state underlying everything. It's descriptive. What does it mean for the Anglo-Americans? How do their laws follow from the social state? How do their um, their mores follow from the social state? How this this works everything. You know, in the 1840 volume, Tokyo is a lot more sullen about a lot of things. This is where that individualism as atomization discussion comes in. This is where he sort of talks about the Cartesian philosophy behind the Americans. Um, there's kind of a, a darkness behind the 1840 volume that we don't necessarily get in 1845. And I don't know too much about this, but um, the 1840 volume, I believe, was uh, really widely criticized in France when it came out. The 1835, you know, more mixed. But uh, the, no, same? Uh, no, 1835 was considered the greatest thing. You know, mm -hmm. last okay. But 1840, at least, yeah, it was widely criticized in France for what it presented about. So I think there's a there's a lot of uh, distinction between them. There's a there's a distinction in tone. There's a distinction in in subject matter. What Tokyo cares about. Um, that theme of associations gets carried through. But in the second one, um, he's really reflecting, I think, on bigger questions. What what is it that America is? What is it that defines it? And really, what's the darker side of all these phenomena that we've seen in the 1835 volume? More questions from our audience. Yes. Is like a, a question about I, I'm kind of struck by the optimism, kind of like that downturn of Tokyo Blue. But, but in some sense, you know, these guys are talking about access to political power, uh, which seemingly for them would mean access to who passes laws, the Ministry of Justice, and kind of regulates uh, commercial society. And there's no sort of reflection, it seems, on taxation, um, on conscription, on the sort of burdens that are associated with, with citizenship traditionally. Um, and, and what's kind of striking is just they are living you know, constant, you know, later in life, but they come to a much later life. And a period of astonishing peace, the European history, right? That after Congress of Vienna in 1813, it's ironically better than it, who hates hot commerce like nothing else, right? But he says we need this kind of order to prevent war because war is the path to democratization. So the conservatives in Europe are actually bending over backwards to avoid war because they see that as what's going to cause um, you know, democratization. Tokyo seems to be more optimistic, saying, well, commercialization, you know, with commercial society, you know, there's a kind of political education and on participation in the marketplace. You're making judgments about the value of things. You're learning about how tax policy will work for you. But then everything goes awry, you know, after 1848 and after the Crimean War as well, and then, you know, the late 19th century. And, and I think part of what's kind of hard about translating Hong Kong into our contemporary situation is that I don't know that we're really in, you know, what Tokyo would describe as a democratic society in the sense that. Most of us who are working so hard in working corporations, they tend to be hierarchically organized, they have to militarized construction model. Yeah. And so we're not used to the same kinds of daily kinds of professional autonomous yeah. decisions that people are making. So I'm wondering if that's kind of some of the puzzles. 
Yeah, I had a lot of I had a lot of reactions to what you're saying. So let me let me comment on the last one first. Um, you know, Tocqueville comments about uh, his fears about an aristocracy of, of industry or his. So he says, if aristocracy comes to America, it will not be in the form that we recognize in France. It will be this new industrial aristocratic bus. Exactly what you described, right? Um, I don't think that necessarily means that all of those democratic elements of society have been entirely eroded, but I do think you saw an, aristoc an aristocracy of industry as like an option of the democratic. Um, the other reaction I had to some of this, so, so you know, Tokyo himself after 1848 does become much less optimistic than a lot of this. I mean, the, the Tocqueville, and, and even the Tocqueville of the 1840s in France is much less optimistic than most of this today. Um, so you can certainly see that in his own in his own ways. Um, he also, as a member of a, the Chamber of Deputies, deals with all of these questions that you're talking about, like taxation, conscription. At some way, he says, you know, it's like it's like drudgery in some ways for him. It's, it's kind of boring. Or he thinks he can't make his mark on greatness and deals with some of these questions, but he does deal with them. Um, there's a there's a book called Tocqueville's Political Economy um, that sort of deals with looks at Tocqueville on all of these individuals. Um, the other thing that kind of struck me, and I don't know, I don't know if this is true, you know, um, you know, you're talking about the conservatives in Europe at the time trying to thwart some of these issues of democratization. The liberals at the time seemed to accept that uh, democracy as a social state could not be thwarted. So um, one of them writes, uh, this 1837, you know, democracy is here to stay and everybody, everybody notices it. Uh, now let's, now let's move on from that and talk about the next stage of things. So, they accepted that social state point as an inevitability. And I think for, for certain reasons, I mean, a lot of them, well, some in particular, educated uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment theory, right? This kind of stadial theory. This is here, this is the state of society. Um, Tocqueville himself, owing to this generation of the 1820s, that thought in terms of social state. So I think, one, to say there's, there's much less optimism than I was ever presented in this talk. And two, there's an inevitability about some elements of democracy that I think the conservatives of the time don't, don't share. So what it's worth most likely writes at great length about both taxation and the short the same about text, description. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and there's even a few key things you spoke to about taxation theory about why we shouldn't tax air, for example. In the same text <laughs> principles of politics, there's a in the section on property, there's also a whole section on this sort of issues of the Yes. Uh, yeah, if, you, if there's a thread that runs through this, like something, you know, like the dichotomy of, of like freedom and structure, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking that Putin and China are maybe teaching us a lesson about how that pendulum shifts. And uh, that maybe this is the reaction. In other words, you're talking about a period of prolonged peace. Well, we've kind of had a period of prolonged peace, and maybe part of what evolves in that is uh, is the, the pendulum swinging back. I'll leave that one for someone else. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not I, don't, I don't feel qualified to. That's as good. That's as possible an answer as any. I think an authoritarian reaction. I think. Mm -hmm. that. <laughs> I'll leave that. Yeah. Do you have any other questions from the? Uh, Zuma? No? Okay. Uh, well, then, in that case, I think all that's left for us to do is to thank Professor Engel very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you all again on the 7th of April, whether you are in Zoomland or in person. Um, and until then.